Let's pray again before we open the word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is uh, powerful, it's alive, it's true. Lord, prepare our hearts, Lord. May you speak to us, Lord. I pray against distractions, against anything that might hinder the work you want to do in each heart here, and that we would receive as you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. We've been there for quite a few months. Uh, there's been times in Ephesians where we've really hunkered down and really, really gone through things very, very, very slowly. There's been other times where we've kind of moved a little bit quicker. And this summer, we're, we're really focusing on Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. And it's kind of the whole summer, right? Really hunkering down on this passage, uh, spiritual warfare, the armor of God. Uh, this is the fourth week so far in this uh, sort of series of messages with, within Ephesians 6. If you remember four weeks ago, I introduced the whole idea about spiritual warfare, our enemy, his goals, his intent, his limitations, right? He's not, omni- he's not omniscient, he's not omnipresent, things like that. Uh, and, and then that gospel command to be strengthened in Christ. Three weeks ago, Pastor John dealt with a belt of truth, how truth is so critical in this battle as we deal with the deception of the devil, right? The lies of the flesh and the world. To counteract that deception, we need the truth of the gospel, which is Christ, the word. Last week, Pastor Aaron dealt with the breastplate of righteousness. He spent a bunch of time on Romans chapter 3, getting at the gospel, the righteousness of Christ for us, given to us by faith, which battles in our own self-righteousness, right? Well, today we look at verse 15. And again, we're going to read the, the whole passage here in context, and so just, uh, but really focusing on verse 15. Again, this is Ephesians 6, if you have your Bibles, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces, against the rulers, against the authority. Yeah, there we go. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. That last line, shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, over the years, I'm sure many of you have too, you know, as we've maybe read or memorized or studied the armor of God, um, so much of it is just kind of obvious. It's straightforward. Yes, it's deep theology, but it's kind of like, okay, I get it. You know, the belt of truth, you know, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, sword of the, you know, it's the word of God, the shield of faith. But this one, for at least for me, this shoes for your feet, the readiness, all this stuff, to me, it always felt kind of cumbersome. It felt like, well, this isn't, this isn't as simple as the other ones. Oftentimes, the presentations you hear about this specific part is all related to sharing the gospel. It's evangelism and playing off the, the words that Paul uses for in Romans 10 about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, right? Evangelism, share the gospel. Be ready to share the gospel. Here's the deal. I don't think that's the point, okay? It might be a little bit of an application, but I don't think that's really the main point here. Uh, it's, it's just not in the context. We're gonna get to that. Friends, there's a lot going on with this. And this portion of the armor, frankly, is just as deep and it is just as profound as the others. It's pretty awesome to dig into, which is what we're going to do today. And I feel the best way to do this is simply to walk through with some basic observational questions. They're going to help us to uncover what Paul is saying and then to connect what Paul is saying. So here's, here's kind of our journey. Uh, first question, what's the connection between shoes and readiness? Two, uh, what is this gospel of peace anyway? And three, then how does the gospel of peace enable readiness or connect to readiness. That's kind of the plan. Again, we've said it for three straight weeks, all of this, this language, this imagery, this metaphor, it's dealing with the battle that God's children, God's saints, believers in Christ, have against the spiritual forces of evil. It's battle imagery. That's why Paul uses this metaphor of armor. He's not using a metaphor of of a chef or of a doctor or of an Olympian or other things. It's 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 an armor, it's battle. So let's look at this first question. What's the connection between shoes and readiness? Again, he says in verse 15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So let's start with shoes. Let's just go walk through this. What's Paul doing there? Again, the metaphor is armor, specifically first century Roman armor, not second century. Even some things changed between first and second. Even late first, it was changing a little bit. But first century army, the shoes, kind of interesting. It's very interesting. You know, shoes are not really the first thing we think about with the armor. 
Uh, you might think, you know, the shield, that's cool, right? The, the, the sword, the breastplate, the helmet, all that kind of stuff. Those are the things that you notice. Those are the things that are feared, right? And yet, as you'll see here today, the shoes are equally as critical. Standard issue, first century Roman soldiers wore what you call caligae caligue or something. Caligula, caligula, that's where he's sort of named, same root, whatever. Sandal boots. And these are open-toed sandals that sort of envelop the foot and ankle. You've all seen pictures of them, right? Straps that kind of just go up the leg, right? Shoes are made of layers of leather. The bottom layer was thick. It was rugged. The middle layer was soft. Now, consider the geography, the topography that these soldiers would cover. I mean, it was a massive empire, and it was an expanding empire. So they're constantly on their feet. They're walking. And these shoes were made to prevent blistering, to prevent trench foot. I mean, just consider in our life just how valuable foot care is for integrity, foot integrity, let alone soldiers. Here's the deal. These shoes, though, had hobnails in them, spikes driven through the leather out the bottom. Some archaeologists have found pairs with up to 100 of these little spikes. And these little spikes had a combat application. Anybody want to guess what it is? Yeah, stability, right? Stability. That's the main thing. There were some other things too, like psychological warfare of stomping, and, and if somebody had fallen, you could stomp on them, things like that. But the main thing was like stability, firm footing. If you go down in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you're done. And that's what Paul's getting at here, the grip, stability, firmness. If the ground is loose, there's grip. There's a firm footing in battle. We do that the same thing in sports today, right? What do we got here? A cleat. It's like, what, what's the purpose? Right, so I try to play baseball without cleats. Is it, is it going to work? No, you might be really fast. You're going to slide all over. Same with football, right? Or any, any sport that uses things that dig in to give you a firm foundation and stability. Think about it. A Roman, a Roman legionary with helmet, belt, breastplate, sword, shield. They look cool. They look fierce. And yet without stability, they're completely helpless, right? The shoes with these spikes provide a solid footing in battle to make them ready to fight, sustains them in the fight. It's just so key. So what's the connection here between the shoe metaphor and readiness? Notice how Paul writes this. Shoes for your feet having put on the readiness. Put on shoes, put on readiness. It isn't the gospel of peace that is the metaphorical shoes here. It is readiness. Yes, there's a connection between the two, and we'll get to that. But readiness is the idea. Readiness is the real aspect of armor that he's getting at. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk in a second how the gospel relates to that. But readiness is so important. He's drawing our attention to this idea of readiness. Now, in a sports world, you hear phrases all the time, stay ready or, or be ready. W what does that mean? What does that mean if I say, hey, stay ready, stay ready? I told that to my kids before. That means maybe when they're not even playing, right? You, you work hard, you still practice, you train, you prepare as if you're going to play at any moment. And when that time comes in, you're just on, right? You're warm. You don't come in cold. You come in ready to handle every situation. And there's a deep level of preparation that connects with staying ready, a deep belief. My time is coming. I got to be ready. But also, there's another aspect of not only staying ready, but then even being ready in the moment. That is not a stable or passive state, right? It focuses you on being alert situationally. It focuses you to notice things. It focuses you to pay attention to yourself, what you're doing, and why. We're going to illustrate this. Josiah, where are you? Where are you? All right, come forward, Calvin. Calvin is our resident baseball expert. Calvin, come on. You got to at least stand up. I know you don't want to come up here. But uh, Calvin's our baseball expert, you know, played professionally and all this kind of stuff. He's going to grade Josiah on a few things. Josiah, demonstrate what an infielder looks like not being ready. Taking your nose. You've all seen it. T-ball. Calvin, is that looking about right? Looks like my guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Friday night, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now demonstrate what it looks like. You know, pitcher's about ready to throw. What does it mean to be ready? All right. Calvin, that, that was pretty bad. Okay, all right. What do we got? You gotta be on your toes a little bit, gotta be ready to move. There we go. All right, thank you. All right, good job. Nice work. All right. 
Yeah, right. You're not standing straight up as an infielder. You're reading everything, right? And being ready as an infielder, you know the count. You know where the runners are. You know how many outs there are. You're watching the batter. You're watching the batter's feet. You're watching everything. You're ready. You already have a plan, right? You know exactly what you're going to do to handle every situation, right? Nelson Mandela said, one cannot be prepared for something while secretly believing it will not happen, okay? The idea of readiness, it is very living. It is dynamic, it is that state of mean, being. Friends, readiness, it includes knowledge, right? But it's not the same as knowledge. It's not just an IQ thing. It's not just a gifting thing. Rather, it is a preparatory state of being where a person is momentarily ready to think critically, to make decisions, and to respond to challenges in the most effective way. Are you starting to see, maybe, why Paul would speak about readiness as we think about the battle, spiritual warfare? Notice Paul doesn't just stop with, hey, choose for readiness. He continues to write, and, which is this crucial reality of this kind of readiness. And that's really our second question, because then he starts talking about this thing called the gospel of peace. And so we got to define it. What is the gospel of peace? You see, readiness that Paul speaks about as armor is given to us. It's a byproduct. It's enabled by what? The gospel of peace. Remember the context of warfare. We are called to stand strong against the devil, putting on peace, helps us get to war. Isn't that an interesting paradox? Theologians have often called this the lofty paradox. Put on peace that helps you in war. Let's break it down a little bit. What is this gospel of peace? Sounds like a big deal. Throughout Ephesians, Paul actually talks about peace a few different times. The greatest, I think, is in Ephesians 2.14, and he says, for he himself is our peace. That's Christ. Christ is peace, objectively, personified. But let's go deeper. There, there's just a perfect statement that Christ makes in the Gospels that talk about this. That I, it wouldn't be surprising if that was in the back of Paul's mind as he's writing this. This is from Gospel of John chapter 14. We're going to look at this because it is beautiful. John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give you peace. Let your hearts not be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Notice the pronouns, friends. Peace I leave to you. My peace, I give to you. Jesus is clearly articulating the source of peace, which is himself. He's also articulating the directional nature of this peace. It is his peace, and he then gives it to us. And it's really important for us to notice that when Christ is talking about peace, he is not at all referring to conflict in this life. He's not at all talking, well, you're not going to have any sort of conflict in your life. That's not at all what the Bible says. Again, note the connection here between Ephesians and warfare. So what kind of peace is he talking about, friends? He's not talking about political peace. He's not talking about, you know, uh, governmental peace or military peace. He's talking about spiritual peace. And he speaks about peace in two different ways. Objectively, that deals with our relationship vertically, right, with God. And subjectively, which deals with our inner experience with our life. And both are so important and both directly relate to our text in Ephesians 10 today. Let's think about objective peace. I mean, right here, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And that statement then begs the question, why do we need this peace? Peace is a state of, of mutual harmony between people or between groups. So the opposite of peace is a state of opposition then, right? Friends, we're, we don't like this part, right? But we got we to gotta see it, our sin, the sin that you and I were born with, the sin that we commit every day in our thoughts and our words and our actions, it keeps us in opposition to God and what he wants for us. It is not a state of harmony. It is a state of war in its nature. And we are the traitors. We are the backstabbers. We are those who have turned our back and rebelled against the king who in his holiness will not tolerate that. And the results, in a very real, objective way, is opposition with God. That is our nature, left to ourselves. We do not have peace with God, right? And yet something happened. Someone happened. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Paul says, Jesus is our peace. In the midst of a dark situation, Christ happened. Let's stay with the whole battle imagery here. I love this. I love this. Hope you can see this picture. Yeah, one of the great uh, ideas in, in, in the Bible and throughout time, Christ is not some dainty little sugar plum, okay? He is the divine warrior 
through his death and resurrection. And he took on and he took out the enemies of sin, death, and the devil. And he's not only taking on those enemies, enemies but he defeated them. Hebrews 2.14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Sin, death, the devil, defeated. Jesus redeemed us from the oppressive power, sin, death, and the devil, to whom we have been bound by in our treachery. Colossians 2 says, he disarmed the powers that triumphed over them on the cross. Victory. Second century church father Irenaeus, he said this, God became incarnate, that means become man, that he might kill sin, deprive death of its power, and vivify, that means bring to life, man. Isn't that awesome? Friends, in real space, time, and history, 2,000 years ago on the cross, God was made flesh. He, your sins were dealt with. Victory was won. That is objective. Deliverance is objective, firm in Christ. And this means that that which had separated us from God, that which had prevented peace with God, that which causes opposition, is removed. He himself is our peace. My peace I give to you, and that is the gospel of peace, at least part of it. And through placing our trust in him, my personal trust, my faith in him, through surrendering my life to him, Christ then creates that peace in us. And this objective relationship with God has changed. Paul says in Romans 5, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, peace with God. The judgment has been taken away. God's wrath on my sin has been removed. His grace in Christ, it rests on me, the robe of righteousness. I am his child. I am adopted. The war is over. Isn't that great? But friends, all that has enormous internal consequences. You see, this objective peace changes things inside too. Think about it. Think about it. Objectively, if I know if I know I have peace with my maker, despite my sin, it's in Christ. I, I, my eternity is set in Christ. I, I have the hope of heaven in Christ. My sins are forgiven in Christ. This life is not all that there is. God is with me, and he is dwelling in me through his spirit. You are not alone. And that objective reality of peace creates in you a powerful trust and confidence in our inner spirits. That whatever we are dealing with, whatever's thrown at you by the world, the devil and the flesh, be it external conflict, temptation, spiritual warfare, pain, suffering, you are able to, by God's grace, to see it through the lens of the cross, see it through the lens of Christ, see it through the lens of peace himself. And Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not them be afraid, right? And he says also in John 16, I have said these things to you. He wants you to know this that you may have what? Peace. In a world, you will have tribulation, right? But take heart, I have overcome the world. He is the victor. The gospel of peace is Christ for you. The gospel of peace is victory, very objectively, and yet changes us internally. All right, let's, let's get practical now, okay? Let's, let's bring it all together. Let's some, connect some dots, because here's the question. How does the gospel of peace then enable readiness? Because Paul's saying, hey, be ready. And that readiness is enabled by the gospel of peace. Well, remember the nature of readiness, right? It's not stable. It's not a passive state. You are situationally alert. You, there is self-awareness there. You are aware of others. You are expecting an engagement. You have a plan for it. You, you have the ability then to respond to the challenges. It is a very living, dynamic thing. Let's apply that to our spiritual battle, friends. Think about this for yourself. Think about this. Hear this. Every day, this is the reality. The spiritual forces of evil come at you with lies. Every day, the spiritual forces come at you with doubt. Every day, the spiritual come, forces come at you with confusion. They come at you with distraction. They come at you with pride. They come at you with self-righteousness. He is restless. He is ceaseless. He comes at you in unexpected ways, subtle ways, and he is constantly changing his tactics that he is performing and perfecting over these centuries. He might whisper in your ear one day, man, you're such a good Christian. Look how awesome you are. 
right? You're just so great. But that other guy over there? Ugh. And maybe the next day he's going to whisper in your ear, you are the worst Christian in the world. How can God love you? He might encourage you one day to just be totally lazy, to be that satisfied, fat, and happy Christian where you do nothing. And the next day he's going to might encourage you to be that jerk Christian that no one wants to be around. <laughs> He's going to do anything to try to trip you up, anything to numb you to Christ, anything to marginalize your faith, anything to make you neglect meeting together as the body of Christ, anything to justify your sin, anything to get you to compromise. This is the battle. And we enter it the moment we become a child of God. And that should not surprise us. The great fourth century preacher Chrysostom wrote, he he wrote a whole study on Ephesians. It's great, right? He wrote this. If we are, oh, I don't have that. Oh, I ruined it. <laughs> if we are at war with the devil, this is what Chrysostom said. If we are at war with the devil, we are at peace with God. Fear not, therefore, beloved. It is the gospel, that is the word of good news, already is the victory won. That means also that if we are at peace with God, we are at war with the devil. You see that? See that relationship? Now, here's the deal. Please get this. We're going to lock in. We're going to land this, Okay. So if you forgot everything else, just pay attention, okay? Everything that I have just said there regarding how the devil goes after us and all these things, the rage that he fights us with, the spiritual warfare, everything that I just said there, we sit there on a Sunday morning and we're like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. I know it. I get it. Yep, I have an enemy. He's trying to get me to to trip up. We get it cognitively. We have knowledge about it. We see it. And we agree with it because the Bible says so. But here's the deal. Knowledge is not the same as readiness, right? We are so often (laughs) like that kid in the dugout who you say, all right, go play defense. Are you ready? Yeah, coach, absolutely. And you turn around and then you see this. (laughs) This is what we're like. Not even ready. Ball's coming right at him. Probably going to hit him in the head. And so for us, so often this is us in the spiritual battle. Day-to-day life, we simply are not ready. And his tactics trip us up, and that is what Paul is speaking us to, readiness. Readiness. Final question. I don't have this in your notes, but you can write it down. How do you pursue daily gospel readiness? Okay? Because again, that's, that's the whole idea, right? I'll give you three parts. Three parts. Try to bring this all together, right? Readiness, gospel enabled, all this kind of stuff to help us fight. I mean, the whole picture, right? Number one, spiritual training, ongoing spiritual training, reps, right? Are you in the word for yourself? Friends, today is not enough. Today's not enough. Are you in the Bible for yourself? Are, 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 is there training happening there? It is a life giving word, it is the most powerful thing there is. Are you praying? How's that communion with with God? Are you being nourished by the sacrament? Are are you a communal believer where you actually value, man, I need to be together. This is so important. This is my lifeline. The Bible knows nothing about individual Christianity. You can't fight alone. You're easy prey. Are you growing in your understanding of your faith? Do you care about your faith? Do you care to understand it? That's all related to the spiritual training that is ongoing, that isn't just one day a week or every once in a while, it's every day, right? And yeah, there's always ups and downs, but it's like, it just, this is part of it. That, that's the first part of gospel-enabled readiness. Again, I'm speaking to Christians here, okay? So if you're not a believer, this doesn't apply to you, <laughs> right? You're actually not in war. Yeah, anyway, that's another topic. Should have brought that in. The second part, daily expectation of attack, This is where I think we fail. We might get number one right, but sometimes we don't pay attention to number two, right? Are you aware of this? Friends, it's not like a a possibility. This happens. Uh, And so what does this mean, right? Well, we'll we'll expect it. Again, imagine, imagine that infielder, right? And before that pitch, he's anticipating everything. He's reading everything. And he's anticipating a ground ball right to him. And he knows exactly what he's gonna do, right? Because he knows exactly what is necessary, He's ready for it, okay? How about this in your life? What would happen if you said to yourself, self, I'm gonna be tempted today. This is gonna happen. Self, 
The spiritual forces of evil are going to come at me throughout the day. Self, the spiritual forces of evil are going to try to deceive me. And it seems like, man, I really struggle with X, Y, Z. He's probably going to try to get me to do that, right? Expect it. It's not a surprise. You are in a battle. Daily, expect that. And third, have a plan, gospel plan, right? Again, I keep going back to that visualization of that infielder. You visualize it in your head exactly what you're going to do ahead of time so that when it happens, boom, it's done. As a believer, the plan is the gospel of peace. The plan is Christ. And yet it's not bad, it's not wrong for us to spend some time visualizing spiritual warfare in our lives. We can call it gospel visualization, right? And we think and prepare before it happens. Self, I'm going to get tempted today. And you know what? He's probably going to come at me in these different ways, right? He's going to come at me trying to get me to do these different areas. What happens? How am I going to respond to that? And we can imagine already, all right, when that happens, I'm going to sink my feet into the gospel, firmly plant my feet into the gospel. I'm going to sink my feet into the identity of Christ. I'm going to sink my feet into the divine warrior. I'm going to sink into that objective peace of Christ. And because of that, because it is ready to respond and I immediately go to Christ, I'm able to respond by claiming all the promises of Christ. I am his child. I am baptized. I am forgiven. I have the hope of eternity. I have Christ. He is my savior. He is my divine warrior. He is reigning. I have him. I have peace. And by speaking the word, guess what? There you go. It's done. Right? Battles are won and lost by preparation and readiness. And being ready allows us to quickly sink into the gospel of peace, the sure footing in the battle, right? And so when we're attacked, and it's going to happen today, it's going to happen tonight, it's going to happen tomorrow, in whatever ways, right? We're ready, we anticipate it, and we just stand firm. God's the victor. We stand in confidence, we stand in hope, and we stand in peace. I love these images of this old motif, Christus Victor, right? Christ is victory. The image of Christ, right? Our divine warrior who has conquered sin, death, and the devil. Google it sometime. Just Google Christus Victor, and you can see amazing artwork from the early church of Christ as this warrior grabbing people and moving them from one side to the next, right? Bringing them into life over our enemies, Friends, Christ is our peace. He is our armor. And may we allow his gospel and then that gospel of peace to help us stand. And may we allow his power to be at work in us to enable us to stand. And may we allow his truth to help us every day, every moment, expect what's coming and yet rest in the peace of God knowing there's already victory. It's done. And may his peace fill us with joy. This is nothing to be afraid about, friends. May it fill us with joy. May it fill us with confidence. May it fill us with hope, boldness, and courage, and patience as we traverse this thing called life and as we await the promise of heaven. I invite you to take a few moments of just private time with the Lord, private confession as as the Lord uh, speaks to you. And then we'll join together with Psalm 51. Let's join together in prayer, the prayer of a confession. And make this your prayer today too as well from Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Pray to me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Father, thank you for your word today. It's life-giving. It's life-creating. It's life-sustaining. 
And Lord, as we dive into just the reality that we all deal with, just the battle, our enemy, the call to be ready, but not a, not a superficial readiness, not a pull up our bootstraps kind of readiness, but a, but a gospel readiness, a readiness that is rooted and enabled through you, peace personified. You are our peace. Father, I pray that, that every day we would, we would recognize the battle, that we would anticipate it, that we would expect it, and then we would have a plan to just plant that ourselves in that gospel. And in the midst of that battle, Lord, that we would just claim the promises that give peace, claim the promises of heaven, claim the promises of deliverance, claim the promises of you. Father, it is easy for us to not be ready. Lord, it is easy for us to just give in and to be lazy in our spiritual lives, to, be, to justify our sin, idolatry. It is just so easy. Lord, we struggle with this in our sin. Our flesh wants this. And so, Father, help us in this battle to keep short accounts with you. Help us, Lord, in this time to confess our sin. And Father, thank you, Lord, that your word is so clear, pointing us to the cross where sin was dealt with. Your word is so clear that if you confess our sins, you are faithful and just. And so, Father, today, Lord, if we have confessed our sins. Lord, may you just instill in each believer just the reality and the truth of the full and free forgiveness of sins, the gospel of peace won and given by Christ himself. And may you help us every day to stand for you. In Jesus' name, amen.